It's that acceleration to the instance. The ex, it's the speed of the acceleration, finding that curve, that slow, fast, 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 and absolute stop. You do not give it a punch, a flick, a snap, a push, nothing. Stop your hand. It will all happen. Everything else you do is going to screw up the cast. It's going to, it's going to deteriorate. You just keep moving your hand. Until you gotta, but that's something you just got to keep training your hand to do. Start slow, go fast, fast, stop. That was Ed Javorowski giving us a huge tip to avoid the dreaded tailing loop. We are taking your fly cast to the next level today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Before we jump into it today, I just want to give you a heads up to a past episode we've had on casting. Episode number 27 with Tim Rollins. Uh, Tim breaks out a little more on spay casting. So if you want to dig more into spay casting after this episode, check out Tim Rollins. There's also a bunch of great stories, including how he uh, flew, learned to fly up in Alaska. So uh, check that out. Uh, uh, Bookmark it or remind yourself a little bit later. That's a good episode. Ed Javorowski is here to share the steps to perfecting the fly cast with a focus on a few easy principles. We find out why there is so much bad advice on casting out there, including the 10 to 2, why acceleration is the key, and what the critical angle is, plus a bonus on how to do the double haul, how and when to do it. Hint, Ed does it every time he uh, casts, even for short casts. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsor. Koffler Boats specialize in custom-ordered aluminum boats and uses the best materials, components, and accessories available to meet all of your fishing and boating needs. The Jet Drifter, a perfect powerboat for shallow water rivers or lakes, will perform with as little as a 35-horsepower prop engine. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash koffler to check out the lineup right now. That's... Koffler, K-O-F-F-L-E-R, wetflyswing.com slash Koffler to check out uh, the lineup and connect with Joe. So without further ado, here is Ed Javorowski. How's it going, Ed? Very, very good. I'd have to be twins to be any better. <laughs> nice. It's great to have you on here. Your uh, your name has popped up a number of times. We were talking just off there there about some of the great guests we've had on. You know, Rick Pope and with TFO. A lot of good people have mentioned you and and your book. You you've got another book that's out. So we're gonna we're gonna highlight that and uh, talk about some tips on casting. But before we jump into all the fly casting, let, let's hear how you first got into fly fishing. Well, I got, in, I got into fishing generally right after World War II. I had an uncle who came back from the war, and he would take me fishing once a week. We were fish. I was five years old, six years old, and we'd be fishing once a week for blue, uh, bluegills and things like that locally. Uh, and then we started fishing in south, all through South Jersey for pickerel with fishing minnows, you know, shiners and stuff. And I eventually had one uncle who was a priest who gave me an old fly rod with an automatic reel, and I didn't know what to do with it, so I fished worms on it for, for <laughs> a while. And uh, then uh, little by little, I got a better piece of tackle, started meeting people. This was in the, through the 50s. Uh, and I started tying flies all on my own. I just got a book, The Old Family Circle Guide, and I learned a few things, tied woolly worms and whatnot. And on uh, June 5th, 1958, is when I caught my first trout on a <laughs> fly, and it was a fly that I tied. It was a little red and white feather streamer. And that was a big, big moment in my life. I couldn't get over the fact that I was fish- I was a big fisherman, essentially, or did spin fishing with spinners. I didn't believe that fish would actually eat fur and hmm. silk and feathers and stuff. But yeah. that, that opened my eyes. And little by little, it just kept growing, met other people, started fishing different waters. Uh, one connection led to another. And throughout the 60s, I was really, really getting into it uh, pretty heavily um, while I was still doing all other types of fishing, too. But that, that's where the, the uh, fishing came by the set by 70. I had 1970 or so. I had a little bucket list. Uh, I wanted to go to Montana. Number one, I wanted to catch an Atlantic salmon and I wanted to catch a tarpon and a bonefish. Hmm. And within the next two, three years, I did all of those things. And then I had to keep adding, finding other things to go into the bucket list. So <laughs> it was about 20, 20, 20 years then until I, uh, and then of course the big momentum when, uh, when I first met lefty and that changed my life completely. 
Yeah. That yeah. was in the 70s. That was in the 70s. Okay, and I want to talk about that a little bit. Where And where are you uh, now, Or and where did you grow up? Uh, a, a lot of people will tell you I haven't grown up yet. I'm just a little kid that goes fishing, <laughs> but I'm outside of Philadelphia. I was born and raised in Philadelphia, and I live just outside the city right now in the western suburbs, just out past Valley Forge. Um, so uh, I'm native of this area, city kid, basically. And uh, uh, so I went to school here, stayed here for university and graduate schools and everything else. Oh, okay. So, yeah, you're, you're in Philadelphia now. Yeah, I'm a Philadelphian. Okay. Is it always sunny in Philadelphia? <laughs> not necessarily. Not yesterday but, afternoon it wasn't. I mean, we had a torrential downpour. I, when my phone started buzzing like crazy, alert, alert, local flooding. Oh, and wow. One thing and another. Right, right, yeah, oh, yeah. We had just a torrential. A storm came through, and it was just torrent. It turned black, and we had two hours of heavy rain. Right now the sun is shining. It's beautiful. Oh, cool, cool. It that, gets humid. It gets it gets humid in the summer. Apparently. Yeah, in the summer. Okay, yeah. I, I just uh, I was kind of a little bit of inside joke. There's this show called It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. This comedy uh, TV show on I think I think it's on one. Of the yeah, channels. yeah. But uh, <laughs> anyways, not, I'm always not, interested. Not quite, not quite true. No, it's not quite true. Okay, good, good. And uh, and are you are you into sports or anything like that? Basketball. I know uh, Philadelphia had some good uh, Allen Iverson and that crew. Is that something you're interested in? Well, no, you know, I had an uncle, my, my, one of my dad's brothers was an NFL back judge for 30 years. Oh, wow. His son, that was Stan Javi, Steve Javi. They changed their oh, name yeah. to Javi. Yeah, oh, Javi, right. And, and Steve, yes, Stan Javi. Now, Steve Javi was an NBA official for I 30 years. I remember Steve Javi. Yeah, I remember Steve. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, awesome. yeah. He's, he's my first cousin. And uh, so, but, you know, myself, no, I have, I have, was never very athletic. I, when I was a kid, of course, I played basketball and football and, and baseball, and I stunk at all of those things. <laughs> uh, when I went to high school, they, they had a freshman field day. They wanted to see if they had any diamonds in the rough or hidden talent they could develop. They had me run a 100-yard dash, and they clocked me with a calendar. I mean, it, <laughs> slow was putting it mildly. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just, I just didn't have, I just was not an athlete and I'm not really into team sports and yeah. so forth. I just grew up with that fishing background and with my uncles after the war and my dad used to take me down to Jersey shore. We'd be drifting in the bay for flounder and stuff. And uh-huh. my 10th birthday he took me on a, a trolling trip for blue fish off the coast. And that really lit me up because I never felt a fish, you know, <laughs> could pull like that. And so, uh, but yeah. no, the other sports, no, I'm not really into it. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. You know, we, we occasionally talk a little about sports here. And I mean, the the fly cast, I mean, obviously, fly fishing is kind of a sport, I guess. You know, it takes some skill. I mean, on the fly casting end of it, does it take, I mean, so you don't have to be athletic at all to be a great, uh, you know, caster. Is that is that true? Well, I, th- I think it's definitely true. And, and, uh, and, you know, I don't know how you define great caster, though, you know, uh, it's it's to, to, to me uh, it, it helps to obviously have some good uh, coordination i mean there's no question about it but i am really uh, devoted to to one thing which i just define as efficiency which means what is the least amount of effort you can ever use to make any given cast that's the first if, if there's four or five ways to get a fly to a certain place always choose the one that uses the least effort mm-hmm Given you know, given the fact that they could they could easily you could accomplish it any of those ways, look for the one that's the most efficient and what's the least amount of effort. And I I put really high high priority on that. Uh, I could tell you so many people I've worked with. Uh, I had a guy who was a tarpon fisherman. This guy threw beautiful. He threw loops that were so tight they <laughs> could go through a closed screen door. <laughs> you know, and I said, look, I'm not going to show you how to cast any further. I said because distance is not an issue. It's not a problem with you. I'm going to show you how to make the cast you just made with 25 or 30 percent less effort. Oh, that's nice. what it's all about to me. Yeah, I, I was at a show one time. I told a lot of these stories in my recent book. I was at a show. A fellow was giving a demonstration. A young kid. He, he was very, you know, I mean, you talk about athletic. He threw a lot, cast longer than Oliver cast, and the fellow next to me said, "Wow, did you see how far that went?" And I said, "Geez, no." I said, "I was distracted." I said, I was noticing how hard he had to cast. <laughs> I said, with what he had, and it was, it was a long cast, no question, but I said, the, you know, what, what he had to put into that cast, I said, I'm surprised it's not still going. I said, it should have gone 50 feet further. I said, he's not all that efficient. 
he was he was he was strong. He had great time. He was athletic. You know, he could get the job done in that cast. But he's never going to be, in my definition, a great caster because he couldn't control different things and throw in hook cast. Make it go 35, 40 feet and take a 90 degree turn and go behind a tree. You know, he, he's not going to be able to do that until he gets more efficient in his casting. So, you know, it's athleticism, strength. It, it, it can help but it can never be a replacement for efficiency or really understanding the mechanics. That's perfect. No, I love that because we talked or I mentioned, you know, being a great caster, but that sounds like that's a big part of it. How maybe the great casters are the ones that are the most efficient uh, casters. Um, Yeah. And, 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 and they're versatile and and diverse. Uh, You know, look, the guys who win the long driving uh, games with, with, with golf, they're never the top players on the PGA tour because they can wallop that thing, you know, uh, a mile, but they, they, it's not the same as playing the game where you've got to be able to do it all and do all the, have the finesse and the touch and all the other skills necessary. That's it. That's it. I, and I love that you mentioned golf because I, I've played a little golf in my life and I've been terrible at golf. I, I'm, I'm a, I think I'm a better fly caster than a golfer, but I mean, is there a, is there a comparison there to make? I mean, is golf, uh, I mean, is oh, golf a lot harder? I use golf analogies. Oh, no, no. Well, there's a there's a difference because, it, you know, Ernie Schriever used to talk about the difference between games and sports. Sports are things that evolved from our old ancient hunter gatherer instincts. They involve interplay with animals and nature and so forth. Games are synthetic or artificial. You know, we'll set up a, a line. This is out of bounds if you go over this line and so forth. And we keep score and so where, where sports are, are, are more natural, uh, you know, naturally in, involved, uh, evolved. So golf, but th- there are a lot of analogies. I use them constantly. I can tell you at the end of the DVD that Lefty and I made, he said, tell the folks about that golfer you took. A fella asked me a question. This gets back to it. We just talked about efficiency. He said to me, how far do you bring the rod back? Now, I'm, my education is in the classics. So in true Socratic method, I asked him a question to lead, lead him where he wants to go. I said, do you golf? And he said, yes, I'm pretty fair golfer. I said, all right, here's my question. I have a golf ball there, a little white ball. How far do I bring the club back to hit the ball? He perce- and I said, I don't know anything about the game. He proceeded to tell me, well, you plant your feet like this shoulder width apart or something. Well, he's wrong already. He said, you come back like this, you grip it this way. This could be wrong already. He comes back, he said, you do this, you turn your hips, you bend your, you know, cock your wrist. Now the, the club is about parallel to the ground. I said, stop. I said, I'm confused. I said, this doesn't make any sense at all. He said, why not? I said, because I'm standing on the green putting. (laughs) Well, I thought he was going to, I thought he was going to clock me. I mean, he was so (laughs) upset. He raised his voice. He said, well, you never said that. (laughs) And I said, that's right. And you never asked. My question was, how far do I bring back the club? See, I'm a linguist. Words are my life. I said, I bring the club back to hit the white ball. How far? He rubbed his chin and he said, well, well, it all depends. And I held up my hand. I said, stop. I said, stop right there. I said, because I said, ask, that's the same answer. I said, ask me how far I bring the rod back. I said, it all depends. What are you doing? I am so upset with people who teach casting with fixed rules. There are no fixed rules for casting. You know, it's going to depend. You've got to qualify in golf. You do this when you putt, you do this when you, you know, you, you chip, you're going to do, you never in golf do the exact same thing twice in a row ever on a course. Stop and think about it. You're always going to modify the, the length of the string. You know, it's, you, you start out and this is my whole approach to fly casting. I don't teach a different way of casting, a, a different way of thinking about it. On a golf course, you start at, there's a little white ball. The first question you have to ask is what? Where's it supposed to end up next? And only then you keep backing up, back up. And you've got to say, well, is it, is, it, is it 10 feet or is it 300 yards? And do I want to fade this ball to the right or draw it to the left? Do I want to hit and run up on the green? Do I want to put backspin? Is there something behind me? Am I in a trap or am I in the rough and so forth? And only then, the last thing you do is you select the club, depending on what you want to do on that particular stroke, and then you decide exactly how you're going to stand, grip it, swing, and everything else. And fly casting has to be approached the same way if you're ever going to be really good at it. You've got, if I'm standing there making a simple cast, casting 10, 20, 30 feet ahead of me, 
and I take two steps to the right, and now there's a tree behind me or a bush. What I was just doing a minute ago, I can no longer do. So I've got to decide, all right, what do I have to, something's got to change. So why does it have to change, and what are you going to change, and how? That's my whole approach to casting. Gotcha. No, and I and that's perfect. I yeah. think I think that makes a lot of sense. And I love the golf. I love that it fits with golf so much because, I mean, I struggle with. Oh, golf. it's it's yeah. very close. It's very close. That's good. That, well, and so this is good. I'm glad you're saying this because everybody that's listening now is realizing. Okay, it's not like you can't read exactly just a book the exact steps to doing it. But is there a way, you know, like think of somebody who maybe has been casting, but like you said, they're struggling. Like I, I even struggle with that. Sometimes I make my cast and I feel like, wow, I'm working too hard to get this thing out there. Right. Maybe the wind's blowing or something like that, but it's just, there's gotta be a better way. I'm always telling myself, I mean, how, what would you tell somebody that's in that situation? Is there, are there a couple of steps or processes that we can go to check their cast and and improve it? Well, I, I, well, I mean, yeah, if I look at a cast and I just look at any cast, you make one cast and I can instantly see about six things, you know, that could be modified or changed or that I think should be altered, but it really has to start out, not what you do, but you, it's got to start out as a mental, and this is just my take on this thing. It's got to be up in your head. You have to understand what, not what you do. It's people say, how do you do this? I said, I'll make a cast and I'll make it go around a corner or do some crazy thing. And the guy says, well, you know, how, what do you, how do you do that? I said, no, what you have to understand, what has to happen for that to occur? It's again, starting out there, way out there and working back toward the caster. We've always started and our thinking is always with the caster. Do this, do that. It's every cast is, you've got to qualify it. So you start out there and it's, it's either got to go so far or so does this direction. Uh, so what you have to understand is the mechanics, exactly what causes that i can guarantee you that it's going to be one of three or four things i don't care what problems you have i analyze casts by the thousands all around the world i i've never seen any cast that i would that we might label and i don't like this phrase but a bad cast let's say it didn't do what you wanted let's just say right it's it's either this that or the other i the guy was i was giving a lesson and that guy said well it didn't do this i said let's analyze your cast now What's wrong here? I said, it either this, and after I explained my principles to him, it's either this, 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 or this. It's got to be one of those. Now, which one do you think? It? And all he said was, you know, maybe if I turn my shoulder body this way or something, I almost hit him. I said, pick one of these fingers. We, I said, it's one of these guaranteed, no exceptions. So let's analyze your cast and see what this will make this happen. Number two will make this happen. Three does this. And I said, so what was wrong? Let's analyze what we've got. You've got to understand the mechanics. And so many people just don't do that. They, they, they just going to give you rules stand this way. That's going to change. You start here. That changes. You stop here. That changes. Your stroke goes from 10 o'clock to two o'clock. That's going to change. It's perfect for some cast. It's perfect. So it's totally wrong for other casts. You know, uh, these couple principles, there, there are no exceptions, no options. In other words, you know, their principles, their mechanical, it's like talking about gravity. Gravity is not good or bad, but gravity exists. And so all you can do is use it or abuse it. So if you look at one of these principles that I'm using, all you can do is use it or abuse it. It's not going to go away. You just have to apply it differently for different situations. You know, it's it's the same thing as we talk about golf. Well, the, the, the faster the club head is moving when it hits the ball and compresses that ball, the farther the ball is going to go. Okay. How do you start and say, how far do you want it to go? That's what's going to determine what you do in turn. If you don't understand that, it's like baseball. I asked a guy how, how to swing a baseball bat. He stood there, put his bat back on his shoulder and so forth. I said, no, I'm bunting. Oh, you know what? See what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's people's thought processes. They want to go to a fixed formula. Do this, do this, do this, and put it all together, and you'll be able to cast. It ain't going to happen because every cast is going to be different. You make a 20-foot cast, Dave. Let's just say we unroll 20 feet of line. Next cast, I, I unroll 30 feet of line. I obviously had to have done something different, or they both would have gone 20 feet. So what is it that controls that? What, what, what did I change to make it go you know, 50% farther? that type of so you've got to understand how casting works that's the 
there's no there's no way to get around that. I can't tell you what to do until you tell me on every single case what you're trying to achieve. But if you know the principles, it's up to you to figure out which one you're going to modify or adjust or, or adapt to this particular cast you've now got to make. Gotcha. Okay. And I want to talk, and maybe we just start a little bit there with the principles. I mean, can you talk, talk briefly about the kind of the mechanics and some of those principles? Sure. Sure. I'm going to give you the Cliff's notes version here. Yeah. Uh, people don't understand how a rod loads. First of all, you got to understand a rod has only one ability. A rod by itself can only do one thing. Only thing a rod can do is be straight. You grab the tip of the rod or you pull down that line or something, you put a bend in the rod. You know, we, we load the rod. That rod is trying to get back to straight. You let go of the line and it's going to straighten up. It's, it's, so it can straighten up. It's the only thing it knows how to do. People say, well, it can, it can bend. I said, it can't bend by itself. I have to overpower it somehow to bend it. My job as a caster is to get it bent. Now, how do you do that? Okay. Most people think the rod bends back. No rod bends backwards. When you cast, the rod does not bend backwards. Here's an example. If you held, take a piece of rod, you, you're holding your left hand, you grab the line with your right hand, and you pull on the line. You bend the rod, right? You put a bend in it. You put a load on it. That's not the way rods load. It's the exact opposite. Don't move your right hand. Move your left. You need something to hold the tip momentarily in place while the butt moves forward. That's how you generate the bend in the rod. And so the point is this, if that piece of line from the tip to my hand has slack in it, has a belly in it, I can move my left hand. I'm not loading it, am I? Because nope. there's no tension on that tip. I need something that 90% of all these bad casts are caused somehow in one way, shape or form by slack in the system. People are moving the rod, but they're, there's nothing holding the tip. So the very first and most crucial thing is that you've got to have something to hold, anchor that tip just slightly. If you had a spinning rod and you laid a jig or a crankbait or a plug on the floor and you had 15 feet of monofilament line hanging down off your rod tip, you can't cast it. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to reel in all that slack and get the lure close to the rod tip so that when you move that handle, when you come back with that handle, the weight of that lure holds that tip momentarily in place. That's how you generate your bend. Then you reverse it and go the other way for your forward cast. It's the exact same thing with fly casting. If somebody says, hold your rod at 10 o'clock when you start, 10 o'clock, and here we yep. go, this clock business again. <laughs> Clocks are for telling time. Yeah. You just look at that line. You look at that line. It's, you've got about six feet or so hanging down straight to the water, and then it lays across the water. You've got slack. The first few feet of your motion, when you come back with your hand, the first few feet are just pulling that slack out. And you've wasted part of your stroke already doing nothing but getting rid of the slack. You haven't started loading it. And, and so, but I can go into this a little later with my, my uh, critical angle theory, which is, you know, it, which is all the difference. I, I show you how with the tip of your finger to throw 80 feet of line. And that's no exaggeration. I do the demos. But the point is, people have slack in the system. They make a back cast, right? And the line goes back and they got this big, huge loop behind them or, and they start going forward or all they're doing is pulling the slack back out again. So their forward cast isn't loading until they get the line, start moving the far end of the line. So the, the end of stroke, I don't care what time your rod was pointing at. If you didn't start loading till you're almost done with your stroke, you're going to simply try to give it a, a sudden push or a, jerk or a punch or something to try to get that thing loaded you start lo loading it from the first millimeter that your hand starts moving and so slack in the system whether it's on, on the water when you're casting whether it's just hanging a big loop behind you that's the biggest and how many people are going to tell you you watch video after video book after book people say make the back cast when the line straightens out and you feel a tug or something go forward I'm, I will tell you categorically, never let that line straighten out before you go forward. Now that's so you're about thinking because as long as the line is unrolling against the tip, it's holding pressure against that tip top. There's no question because it's unrolling and the energy is pulling to the, to the rear. You want to start forward. Now it's going to vary. There's, there's other little things, but you want to start forward 
when that line looks sort of like a candy cane or a fish hook. Now you got to do this visually at first until your body until your body starts to sense it. Then you, you you develop feel. Feel isn't something you have from the start. You know it's relative to something else. But you start for while the energy is still pulling the other direction, you get instantaneous load. So you're using the energy that's going to help load your rod. Your hand moves an inch. I want to see an inch of bend in that rod. I don't want to see you pull. Once it straightens out, it starts to fall, right? And, and it puts a little bit of slack. The tip, the tip, which had pressure on it, had a little slight pressure with that line, that relaxes. Now you've got to start all over again. And even if you had split second timing to start forward, the instant it straightened out behind you, before it started to fall, you still squandered, you wasted the energy that the unrolling line had. You see, in other words, if you make a back gas, pick up 30 feet, and you just make a back gas, and you let go of the line, and say it takes an extra 10 feet on the back gas, you, you've just shown that that unrolling line had 30 feet, while it's unrolling, has 40 feet worth of energy in it, just to put it in simple terms, right? Because it took an extra 10 feet with it. Now, when we make the back, so if you wait till that, so if you start forward while that line is still unrolling, you're loading, even though there's physically 30 feet, you're go loading against 40 feet worth of pull. You get instantaneous load. If the line straightens out and stops moving, you're back where you started. You've only got 30 feet to load the rod. Yeah. I mean, That's there's perfect. so many things like this, you know. Oh, I mean, I, I explain this to people and they just, this, and invariably, now I've been doing this for coaching now. I've been fly fishing for 65 years, coaching for 45 years. Almost invariably, everybody I work with says the exact same thing. I get the same, but this is so much easier. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's the way it should be. That, that, oh, that, it, that's all I'm talking about. So the first thing is you've got a tension on the system. People squand, they have slack in there or they create it different ways when they're casting. Uh, you know, it, it's like Lefty always said, we've simplified it by saying, look, you can say there's slack in the system. There's no pressure on the rod tip. That's another way of saying the same thing. Another way of saying you've got to get the end of the line moving first before you can load the rod. And so, how do you do that? And, and you know, this is this is the first principle, but it's I don't know what that is, but it's it's so uh, important because you get the end of the line moving. And I say to people, I throw the line out in the water. There's a lot of slack on the water, and I'll say, okay, what do you would you do? Well, you could strip in the slack to get it taut to the tip, right? I said, what if the current was flowing away from you? You could stand and let the current take it out. What are your options? I said, a lot of times. If you've got sl you throw upstream, you cast upstream, it's coming down, it's feeding slack into you. It becomes difficult. All you got to do is get the end moving. You can stand there, shake the rod back and forth, and when that little squiggle <laughs> gets down and it moves the end of the line, you go into your back cast. You can throw a roll cast to get rid of the slack. There's different ways, but you've always got to think one thing. Make sure before you try to load this rod either direction that you get the end of the line moving. I'll stand with a dry fly. I hardly ever pick up a dry fly the way everybody shows you. Come right back off the water. You're dragging the fly through the water. I mean, that's going to help a dry fly, right? <laughs> the, then I simply take a, throw a very mini roll cast with the tip of the rod, boom, and this little spiral runs down the line, and when the end of the fly line lifts off the water, go into my back cast instead of soaking the darn fly. That's the way I fish dry flies morning till night. So, I mean, so slack, slack in the system, not having pressure on the tip, not, you know, trying to cast before you got the end of the line moving there. That's number one. That's great. And then of course we get into the biggie. The second thing is the essence of all casting is the acceleration stroke. I spent 40 years working on this, on the acceleration stroke. Let's get into that acceleration stroke before we get there. I just want to highlight what you said, because that is amazing. I think you painted the candy cane I love because I think that is confused. I mean, I think a lot of people would think, yeah, let it level out. Look at your line. Is it level? Then, you know, so you just clarified that. That's great. And then also, um, so let me just clarify again. So this makes total sense. You don't want slack in your line. You want tension. So let's start with, let's say, for example, you're fishing, you're on a trout water. You didn't need to make a 30, 40 foot cast and, 
And so with like spade casting, mm-hmm. you know, you start with a point where, you know, you want to start with your tip basically in the water, right? That's the first part. That's, you know, point, point P or whatever, you know, you call mm-hmm. it. But that's with a spade cast. But with a trout rod, you know, your little nine foot five weight, you're not really starting with your tip in the water necessarily, right? I mean, if you're, if you've got line, say there's tension on the line, the stream has pulled it down below you, say to the right, uh, but you still have six feet of line between your rod tip and the the surface of the water. Is that okay? Or are we trying to get that slack out of it as well? As much as possible. You, I mean, you got to understand this is not a perfect world and no situation is exactly perfect, but you want to either eliminate that slack or minimize it as much as possible. So the difference between, in my PowerPoints, my Mac, uh, you know, keynote presentation, I got pictures and we've filmed it and done all sorts of tests with this. If my rod is out in front of me at the 10 o'clock position or some such thing, right, uh, or even pointing straight, and the line is draped down to the before it touches the water, that's slack. So the, if you have all things being equal, I will try to po- get that line pointing straight down, or the rod pointing straight down that line. That's going to minimize any slack. It's good. You're much more efficient because as soon as you start to move your hand to make that back cast, you're going to move the end of the line right away. If that rod is high up over the water, the higher it is, the worse it is because the more slack you have. So your your rod's going to be back straight overhead before it even starts to load. And boy, then the dominoes start to fall. The critical angle thing, oh, you can't believe how that's going to affect it. Your acceleration, the length of your stroke is going to affect it. You know, the the, the longer you can keep getting faster in your stroke, the better it's going to be, but you're not even starting to load it till the darn rod's halfway through the stroke. So, yeah, if you can if you can do it by getting pointing the rod right down the line, fine. If you can't get the line straight, as I said, maybe the current's pushing it toward you and it's feeding slack. It's hard. So you come back and you make a quick roll cast to straighten it out and then go immediately into your back cast. Or as I say, you wiggle the line, get the end moving first, and then you can go in. Then it's possible the load of that doggone rod for the back cast. But until that happens, <laughs> I'm telling you, people are using most of the effort that people put into rod are to compensate for bad technique. It's not, and I think it's going to somehow help them, you know, but once you understand how that works, you can't believe how much effort you, you can, you know, get away with or how little effort you can get away with and make a cast. And I, I'll tell you, we, the day that I met Lefty, my mind went, just boom, my, my, I, I just, my whole life changed when he made one cast. And I'll tell you, and I'll, it all has to do with what we're talking about now. The effort. I mean, I just, I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. everybody was ooing and eyeing. And I thought these people just missed the whole point. It wasn't <laughs> the fact that it was a long cast with a, a, a needle, you know, point loop. I said, all I was noticing was how little effort. There was no apparent effort that I could see that he was putting into this. And I thought, He's not strong. He's not muscular. I could take him three out of four arm wrestling, I guess. <laughs> but I thought this, this. I said he knows something. He knows something that nobody here knows, and I have to know what that is. And that's why I spent my life doing now. That's amazing. That's, it. that's amazing. Yeah, and obviously Lefty. Everybody, we've talked about some of Lefty's stories of his when he used to do those displays and kind of the amazing stuff. So he, he, yeah, we've talked a little bit, so we won't dig fully into lefty other than when we touch on a few, maybe a story at the end here, but I want to keep this going. You mentioned, so we kind of talked about slack, how tension is good. Um, what's the next thing is right. acceleration. Right. Is that the next piece? Okay. Well, yes. It, assuming that you've now, all these things are going to happen throughout your cast, but as you know, simultaneously, but as soon as you can get the end of the line moving, there is one motion to a cast. I get very upset with things. People talk, oh, a loading stroke followed by a power stroke. I don't believe there is such a thing as a power stroke. I'm sorry. This is just the way my mind works. There is one. Mo- if you bring your arm back to throw a baseball and you go forward to throw that ball, how many different motions do you make? Uh, one. One. You okay. swing a bat, you make one motion. You swing a golf club, you make one motion. You serve a tennis ball, you make one motion everything you shoot pool you bring the cube boom there's one motion going forward when you cast there is one motion now i consulted a physicist two teams uh, two kinesiologists from different universities teams of engineers let me tell you i'm not a techie i don't know the math uh but i know one thing there there is a math math this acceleration rate is simply a matter of starting slowly 
and getting faster, faster, faster at an ever increasing rate. It's not a matter of just getting faster. It's exponent. It's almost like exponentially increasing. I'll say, in other words, 50%, if, if I'm going to make a, a cast and I'm going to say, I'll move it 12 inches, just pick a number. After six inches, I'm not halfway through to my speed. I'm only about 10% through. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten. It just constantly increases. It's one continue. It's an. It's like a parabolic, uh, you know, sketch that you're making. You're making a parabolic increase. It all like ninety percent of that load comes in in the last few inches. So it's one continual speed up to an instant stop. In martial arts, they talk about acceleration and deceleration. The deceleration is as instantaneous as you can make it. Everybody talks about follow through. There is no follow through in the cast, right? Now, yeah, once you finish, once your hands stop, yeah, you lower the rod to fishing position or you do a reach cast or something like that. That's not part per se of the stroke. The instant your hand stops, the stroke is over because that rod is going back to straight faster than you can blink. So the point is it starts out slowly, faster, 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 faster to an instantaneous stop. And that's it. That's how it loads. That is also going to determine, right, the tightness of your loop. That's how you tighten loops. I mean, it's as simple as that. I can tell you. You start out real fast. You start real fast. And by the end of your stroke, if you're not much faster, you've got a big wide open loop. You know, uh, and, and another thing, a, a, a fellow is in a class I was teaching in Virginia years ago. I kept talking about acceleration, acceleration. I said, I worked 40 years on this. And he said to me, when you talk about acceleration, and he said, uh, do, are you talking, and I forget the word he used, but like lateral acceleration or rotational. Now, I'd never even thought in those, at that time, I'd never thought in those terms, but it took me less than a tenth of a second to instantly see the picture. I said, both simultaneously. In other words, people think rotation is something you do at the end of the stroke. No, it's a, the forward motion, and it, this could be your back cast, but we'll just talk the forward cast, same thing. When you start coming forward, you, your hand is rotating the entire time. Your hand is rotating the entire time. Put your hand back there like you made a back cast. Look where your thumb is pointing. Now start coming forward very slowly and look at your thumb. It's changing constantly. It was pointing to the rear. When you end up, it's pointing to the front. You know, So it's changed, but it's doing on that same acceleration, that same parabolic speed up. It's a, it's a forward accel rotation acceleration. So um, that's something that much more recently I've came to appreciate, but it's still one motion. Um, and so that, that's it. That's, that's how you load. That's how you load the rod. And uh, the longer you can keep, this is just a corollary. We put, I put it in as a third principle. It's just a, really a corollary to, the, to this, that the longer you can keep doing that, remember, you're getting faster at an exponential rate, right? The longer you keep to, to more and more load you're generating. So you want to get more load. You don't go harder. Physicists worked in, in a lab, showed me on three blackboard fulls of calculus in a physics lab, my acceleration. And now I don't know anything about calculus. I was a Latin professor, so I can tell you calculus is a Latin word. It means a little pebble. And that's <laughs> the end of my knowledge yeah. of calculus. But he, he said to me at the end, he said, you see, you never cast harder. You always cast smarter. And it was because of this kind of thing that I learned from these people. I go to ask people about everything that I don't know. I go to these, these this is his world. He, he said to me, you understand all the physics perfectly. And he shook his finger at me like I was a little kid. And he says, you just don't know your math. I said, <laughs> Frank, that's why I'm talking to you. Do the math for me. But, you know, so, you know, it, it's, there's one motion. It starts slowly and it gets faster and faster, but it comes in so definitive at the end. You, you sense that very fast, sudden motion when you've got it down and people say, well, it's a power stroke. Well, there's no separate, it's not a separate thing. It's just the, it's just the last part of that continuous speed up it, that you're really sensing so much. That's perfect. And, but people want to feel that. And so they give it too much too early and that kills it because you've distorted that speed up loop, that's uh, it. you know, that, that, that speed up curve. So, and you, the longer you do it, the deeper it's been. And then the last thing is when your hand stops, the rod tip straightens and that determines where the line goes because 
What your hand does at the end, the direction your hand is moving at the end, when you stop, the direction your hand goes, the tip of the rod mimics the same thing, goes the same direction. And then in turn, that determines where the line goes. So if my hand, when I made a cast, were going downward, let's say, as I come forward, which in short cast, it certainly would be. It's higher, you know, I start forward and it ends up lower. My hand goes downward, the tip of the rod goes downward, the line goes downward. It's just bing, bing, bing. If I want to go farther, what do I do? My hand has to stop going more forward. The rod tip goes forward, the line goes forward. For real long casts, I take the rod back as low as possible, as low as conditions let me, for a real long cast now. And I finish going at a very elevated altitude. I did, uh, you know, your trajectory is aimed way above the horizon. For practice, I used to do things and try to hit a tree branch 40 feet almost directly overhead. My rod tip when I started was almost touching the ground and went almost straight up. Just to, I, I did this to practice. I'm never going to use the line piled at, at my feet almost. You know, obviously, people say, what good is that? I said, the good is that I can do the fact that I can hit that branch directly overhead means that I am loading my rod from as far back and as low as I possibly can. That means when I'm fishing now, I'm not going to hit that tree branch way up there. I'm going out that way at, you know, 45 degrees or something in front. I'm used up. I push this cast to my limit. If I were taller, I could get more out of it. If I were stronger, I could get more. But I determine where do I want it to go? You, you shoot an arrow. And when people say one very famous fisherman, very good friend of mine, he says, oh, you should always cast from up to down when you make a cast. Now that's lunacy. That's like saying you've got a gun, you always shoot downward. You pull an arrow back, you always aim down. Well, if the target is always down there, that's good advice. But if you do, you know, you aim it higher, it's going to go farther, easier. I mean, what's the problem here? I, you know, so you got to determine when you want to throw a curve cast, what has to happen? You want the line to turn to the right or the left? That means what has to happen? That means you have to ha fix it. So when the rod straightens, it turns to the rod or right or left. How do you do that? You get it loaded with a twist, possibly. I mean, there's several ways you can do it. But if my hand does this, the rod tip does this. So if I just want to make a, I'm right-handed, I want to make a curve to the left. As I'm coming forward, if I stop straight ahead, the line goes straight ahead, right? Because the rod tip goes straight ahead, the line goes. But just an instant before it before you can't stop and then try to turn your hand no you end up on a turn i just sharply just before i stop in that last nanosecond i turn my knuckles sharply to my left guess what the rod Boom. tip does the same thing the line runs out and does the same thing there i mean is. it's it's really simple see but you have to understand in principle how this works and then you got to be committed to one thing and i don't like to use this language over the air but it's called practice people hate <laughs> that word it's a dirty word it's a dirt. One guy said, "Oh man, can I just buy a new rod?" I said, "I'll tell you what. <laughs> try it. If it works for you, let me, if it works for you, let me know because I'd like to do that too." But practice, 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 and more practice. You know, they, uh, it's, I love that. There's a couple of basic principles. You're gonna you're gonna vary them and alter them and apply them in different ways, but the principles can't change. Instructions, fixed rules, they change. You say, "Stand this way." Well, I could put this foot forward or that foot forward. Or I could face this way or that way and so forth. I mean, you know, it, rules change. Stop, start here, stop there. For one cast, that's going to be perfect. I, I just get upset with people who try to give you and, and, and try to imply that this is the way to cast. No, it's one way you can make one cast. But don't, don't leave the person with the impression that this is the right way or the way you're supposed to do it. And I think always, always, if you're teaching anybody to cast, qualify it. Say, look, we're going to make a 25 or 30 foot cast. So we have nothing behind us, nothing overhead, blah, blah, blah. There's no wind. We have a small fly or no fly on the end. We're just going to use this to get started to get the sense because this is, you know, understand. And you must always then emphasize that once you are under actual fishing conditions, everything I'm telling you to do here might have to be modified or changed. You, you know, and that's that's important because people come away. Oh, I took lessons from so and so. I went to this 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 class with this thing, and they show me how to cast. Well, no, they showed you how to make one cast. 
you know, because I'm not going to do that when I make a lot on the water. I got to do endless things. Conditions change. Put it. You change the fly. You change the leader. You change the line. You change the rod. You put obstructions around. You get up the wind. Anything changes, and you're going to have to change what you're doing. And you can't start here and stop there if it's not suited for that particular case. So that's all I have to tell, tell people who are teaching. Just make sure that you qualify every decide in advance what you're going to do, you know, what, what has to happen and use these principles to accomplish that. And I say practices, you know, I've never taught anybody to cast, Dave. Never. I've never taught a person to cast. I teach them about casting. I teach them how it works, how A causes B. If you want B to happen, you got to do A. If B is happening, which you don't want, then stop doing A. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And I love that you said I love that you said practice. There was an old um, Allen Iverson who played for the Philadelphia 76ers had this funny clip where he, yeah. his coach called yeah, him out sure. because he, uh, he wasn't going to practice. And, <laughs> and he just said, practice, practice, practice. I missed one practice. You know, you're, you're giving me, you're giving me, yeah. but, but it does come down to practice. And uh, I want to talk more about that as we get into this too, about how, you know, how people can practice if, if they can't necessarily get on the water. But I did want to bring it back to the acceleration. So you mentioned a couple of good things. The, the tight loop, how to get the tight loop is basically to keep that, like you said, start slow and faster, 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 right? That, that gives you the more you do that, the tighter the loop. It is, is that the case? And are we also talking about the paintbrush analogy? Well, the, the paint, that's one thing. We, we use simple things like that. You know, it's lefty's old paintbrush thing. You dip a paintbrush in some water or something and you flick it against the palm of your other hand. Boom, it's that sudden abrupt change. That, you know, the water flies off the paintbrush, right? Another image we use is throwing an apple off a stick. When you're a kid, you're playing, you see how far, you take an apple or a potato and you stick it on the end of a stick, you know, a two foot long stick. See how far you can throw it. If you go real fast, that's at the beginning, it's going to fly off, go up in the air and come down and hit you in the head. If you go too slow and try, it's going to hit the ground 10 feet in front of you. You find that thing. See, and you know, you've got it when you watch what the apple or the potato did. You know what you did in the cast by study the line, the line. Lefty used to beat that into me back in the 70s. The line, the line, the line, the line is your diagnostic tool. It tells you everything that you did right or wrong. When you find that, and you have to find it. It's just a matter of you finding that, that perfect acceleration to a stop. When you get it right, the line just screams at you. You can see the result, and you say, aha, that's it. Now you got to practice till you can duplicate that. You know, people say, well, I, I was casting pretty well today. I just couldn't get it right and so forth. Study the line, the line, the line. That's all you need. I've actually many times turned my back on a caster and I looked at the end of the line. I told him everything he did. Yeah. Because it has to show up. It has to, in the last announcement, when you know what you're looking for, it has to show up in the line. I mean, the shape of the loop, the, the smoothness of the loop. The, 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 how wide or how tight it is, little, whether the energy carries clear through to the end. People say to me, how come I wanted to cast 40 feet? It went 30 feet and piled up at the end. I said, easy. You had 30 feet worth of load on the rod. How do you get 40 feet worth of a longer stroke? You know, it's as simple as that. And so you start back far, start with your rod back farther. Don't push it in at the end. That ain't going to work. Just get back farther and farther and farther. The gotcha. stupid thing about stop your back cast at one o'clock or something. Well, it's yeah, for some casts, that's absolutely perfect for certain casts. And, I, and it, it all comes down to my whole critical angle thing, which I spent 25 years working on with a physicist. And that's when he said, you really understand the physics. Let's jump into that. Ed. Well, first, before yeah. we jump into the critical angle, let's talk about the tight loop again. Remind me how somebody can get a, a more tight loop. Is that from that acceleration doing that correctly? It's that acceleration to the instance, the ex, it's the speed of the acceleration, finding that curve, that slow, fast, 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 and absolute stop. You do not give it a punch, a flick, a snap, a push, nothing. Stop your hand. It will all happen. Everything else you do is going to screw up the cast. It's going to, it's going to deteriorate. You just keep moving your hand. until you can, But that's something you just got to keep training your hand to do. Start slow, go faster, fast, stop. Slow, fast. I first did it under when Lefty got me started. 
I did it under a street lamp in Philadelphia at midnight. <laughs> Catch this. I stood in a circle. I stood in a circle of light. And what I did, I laid the line out behind me on the ground. And I come forward. I didn't want to be distracted by seeing, you know, where the line was going or whether it was good. I was just trying to ex- uh, experience the feel. I would bring my hand forward and stop. And it, all of a sudden, I, I kept doing it and doing it. And then no, no, what I would do, I never made a back cast for six months. I spent six months making, I doubled my practice time. I made a cast, turned around and went the other direction, turned 180 degrees, went the I just made that stroke, that forward stroke. I guesstimated when I was done about 10,000 times. Now that's crazy. I know I'm, I'm obsessive about this, but I would, when I could throw 30 feet of line or so, I'd let out, you know, another five, six, eight feet of line. And I kept doing that. And I just kept coming forward. And finally, I got to the point Well, I got to about 50, 60 feet. I was starting at a hole by that time because I had a lot of line for me. And what I did was I got into the – I would make the cast. The line's lying on the ground behind me. I'm not under fishing conditions yet. I'm not throwing big flies. I just came off the ground, and I'd start forward and stop. And I got that down so much that I was into the backing on 90-foot fly line. I'm shooting – and I felt like I was doing almost nothing. I couldn't feel any effort. And I thought, this is getting crazy. And then you know what I did? I said, all right, if I'm in that position behind me, I can throw this whole fly line. Now, understand under fishing conditions, that cast 90, 100 feet is only going to go 50 feet because of the wind, because of the fly. I don't care. But I, I, pref- I just sharpened up my casting stroke. You know what I did for the next six months? I did nothing but back casts to get into that position. I had it laying in front of me, and I came back and stopped. And I got to the point where I could take and shoot the entire, after several months, I could shoot the entire line on the back cast. And a lot of times when I'm fishing, I fished up with Danny Marini up in uh, Cape Cod, up at Chatham for years. And I can recall one trip, two days, morning till night, I never made a forward cast fishing for stripers, catching a lot of big stripers. I stood on the bow of the boat and we're fishing the, the, the right side, you know, the starboard. And I, all I did was cast backhand from morning to night. And I, sh- I, and I had a hundred foot, I had a teen, it was a teeny uh, 400 or something. And I would sh- simply make the cast with my, I used the forward cast as my back cast, as it were. And I just shot on my back cast. Now I was, sh- I, I stripped into the backing, used the entire line fr- from morning to night. And I would pick it up, get it going, make a forward cast and then shoot the back cast. And so I fished that way constantly. And I could throw back. I, I can tell you this lefty came over in the other boat with Dan's dad. And he said, we've been watching your, your casting there. He said, we can't see the loop. He said, it looks like a pencil line hmm. going back there. So of course it's a slight angle. So it looks even tighter, you know, but he said, I said, lefty, I, I've been working on this cast for three years. He said, well, let me tell you something. He says, you got it down. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the way I fish. See, I believe you should be able to hit anything in a 360-degree circle around you, over your left shoulder, over your right shoulder, right hand, left hand. I I don't do much left hand anymore, but I used to fish a lot of times for shad. I just fish left hand just for the practice. I train that hand. But, you know, you just pivot your body a little bit. You know, you give me something in a circle around me, and, you know, I can usually get there up to to a limit. I'm an old man now, but it's – but the point is – you, you should be able to see most people think a back cast is just, oh, something to just get the line out of the way so I can make this forward cast. Well, I have a whole chapter in this new book on the all important back cast because I spend most of my private lessons, 90 percent are on one thing, back cast, back cast, back cast, back cast, because stop and think for one second. Dave. Anytime you go to go forward, you want to make a forward cast is required for that cast, any given cast, is already been predetermined by what's behind you on that back cast. If you don't have that one nailed, I, you know, because like I say, if, if you go back there and you got this big loop behind you or you got this wiggly line behind you, that's going to affect your forward cast. You're going to have to do something to compensate. You want to make sure that back cast is right on the money endlessly, no matter what you... I put all my emphasis on that back cast because that's going to determine now how efficiently and how well you're going to make your forward cast. 
So that's just so, so important. And it's a fishing pass. It's not, it's just not a thing to get the line out of your way. It's a, it's a bona fide, it's, the, it's your forward cast going the other direction for crying out loud. People say, does this apply to the back cast or forward cast? I said, both, they're the same cast. One goes that way, one goes that way, you know? Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Koffler Boat specializes in custom ordered aluminum boats and uses the best materials, components, and accessories available to meet all of your fishing and boating needs. The Jet Drifter, a perfect power boat for shallow water rivers or lakes, will perform with as little as a 35 horsepower prop engine, but the whole design will also accept larger engines. In addition, the Jet Drifter is also designed to be rowed. The Jet Drifter can be custom built in 14 foot through 18 foot lengths. And uh, I've been rowing Koffler drift boats for most of my life. I remember going down the river in my dad's Koffler boat when I was a kid. And since I have transitioned into the 17 by 54 drift boat, perfect for packing a ton of gear and still staying nimble. If you need a bulletproof boat that can literally sit outside all year long when not in use and take a beating, Koffler has the boat for you. Whether a jet drifter, drift boat, Rocky Mountain trout boat, or sled, Koffler has you covered. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Koffler to connect with Joe and the family today. That's Koffler, K-O-F-F-L-E-R right now. Wetflyswing.com slash Koffler. You support our podcast by clicking over through that link to connect with Joe. Please let Joe know you heard of the ad through the podcast when you connect and check back with me to celebrate if you end up making a purchase. And now back to the show. So I just want to clarify, just so we know where we're at. So we've talked a little bit about kind of, I guess, you know, no slack, number one, number two, accelerate. Along Before we get into the critical angle, you, do, are there a couple other principles we want to make sure to highlight if we, if we stay on this numbering system that we've talked about here? Today? No, 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 that's it. You, here's the way, and I can put it all in one sentence for you. Get the end of the line moving, continuously speed up to a stop in the direction you want the line to go. Perfect. That defines how every cast is made, period. Now, the critical angle, I'll just jump to that Yeah, now, let's do that. Because that, I, 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 did, I determined, you know, I considered that really, I should put it as a principle, but it's not, it's really part and parcel. It operates in what we're saying already. The principal angle, and I, I, I call it critical angle. Lefty hated that word when I first came up with it back in the 90s. And he said, he said, oh, it sounds so technical. You know, however, you don't know. But Lefty would say, oh, I only got a high school education. <laughs> I said, Lefty, watch, watch the 6 o'clock news tonight. You will hear the word critical. Yeah. There was an lots. accident out on the free, freeway, and so-and-so is in a hospital in critical condition. I said, I said, I don't care about the words. I said, call it the important angle. I don't care what you call it, you know, the vital angle. What it is is the angle between the shaft of the rod and the line when you start to load your rod. The phys- I was having a discussion with a physicist, and he said something about, uh, we were talking about angles. It's all angles and levers is what we're really talking about here. He said, well, if that rod and that line are at 90 degrees, in other words, let's say your rod is pointing straight up. Now, this could be overhead or to the side. makes no difference. It's pointing straight north-south, let's say, right? And the line from the tip is 90 degrees to it. It's going east-west, right? That's 90 degrees. Mechanically speaking, that is the least efficient position you could possibly be in. Now, this does not say it's bad. doesn't say it's wrong. We're talking mechanics here. So because what is going to happen, if you move your hand forward on that, move that rod handle forward from that 90-degree rod line angle, right, you are only going to load the uppermost part of the rod, the very tip, which is fine if you're making a short cast. I'm going to throw a fly on the water 15, 20 feet away, right? It's fine. It works. It works. But the longer, the, the more load you need, you know, the wider you make the angle. And when he said to me that 90 degrees is the least efficient, I started doing all sorts of research and testing, and I figured out what is then the most efficient from a mechanical standpoint. Not that you're always going to do one or the other. The most efficient is 180 degrees. The most efficient mechanically, your rod is pointing directly to the rear and the line is coming right out the, at it in a straight line. Because remember what I said about the rotation? If I had my rod, this is only going to be for the extreme cast, or the longest cast, to use the least effort. If that were at perfect 180 degrees, the rod and the line are straight out. When I start moving my hand forward, what happens? 
the first movement already, I'm like at 179 degrees. So I'm loading it right into the butt. And I just keep getting faster and faster as I'm, so I've lengthened my stroke. I've lengthened my, my, I'm getting faster and faster and I'm rotating faster and faster. And this is absolutely scary how efficient and effective that can be. So I change, uh, first thing I look at in a cast, I check the loop and then I look at the angle at which the person started. And obviously you can't have slack in that line either because the rod doesn't make any difference then. As long as you've got that line tight, it's rolling back there and my candy cane is way, way back there and I start forward, I load it into the butt. Here's what you do. Here's what I do with everybody. I will give you, you know, my student, I say, here, take your finger and your thumb and index finger and hold this piece of monofilament leader there. And I put the rod at 90 degrees. I got it pointing straight off and he's standing to my right and it's 90 degrees. And I push on the grip of this rod and it can be an eight or nine weight rod. And I'm pushing until my forearm is aching and I got to grab my, hold it with my other hand because it, I'm in pain and I cannot pull the leader from between his fingers piece of slick monofilament. And I said, now watch what happens. And I said, so how much pull am I generating? No matter how hard I'm pushing, how much pull am I generating at your end? It's almost nothing. I say, how hard is it to hold that? This is not hard at all. So I'm not getting any, you know, there's no energy. I'll move forward. I'll open up that angle. And as I start going forward, I start relaxing and he starts getting the brunt and he's holy smokes. And you can see the curve of the rod from just a little tip bend coming down further and further until that rod pulls right into the handle. And I said, and now I can make the cast with very little effort. I, I, I do this. I laid the rod in my hand like that. I'm going to show recently. And I had the line stretched out on the floor behind me. And I took the tip of my index finger on my left hand and I placed it on the butt of the rod. Now I'm not even using my casting hands to load the rod. I'm just using the tip of my finger. And I started pushing down on the butt slowly and then faster, 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 as fast. And I then had to grab the rod very solidly with my casting hand, right? And we made it. It was between 80 and 85 feet of line it unrolled. And I just used the tip of my finger to turn the rod over because of that critical angle. But it was several things, of course. I made a longer stroke. I got the constant acceleration and uh, the trajectory. It started real low and it ended higher and the line took off. But you see, so the critical angle is a very, very vital, vital part of this. When, when, when we did the DVD with, with the TFO, Rick, it was Rick's idea for, he said, I want you two guys to, we spent three years on and off working on that thing. And I had the chapter in there on the critical angle. And I show that we tied the thing to scales, put a scale on the end of it and, and put it at 90 degrees and start pushing as hard as you can on the rod grip. That dial hardly moves. Point the rod well back, almost straight at the scale. Start moving your hand forward. Man, that dial just goes whoop way up there. Just shows you that you're generating more energy, and you're loading that rod deeper. It's no different from fighting fish. We've been doing that for generations. You hold the rod tip up way high. How do you get more lift with a heavier fish and a heavier leader? You lower the rod. Bring, start bringing the lowest part of the rod into play. You know, you're lifting the fish with the butt of the rod, not the tip. That's the extreme version, like you said, uh, and, uh, oh, you know, we had that episode on the bluefish, uh, you know, we were talking about all that, that work there and, you know, how the change was, is that you point the rod directly at the fish, right? When you're fighting it, yeah, you have a direct straight line, which well, is kind of similar to what you're saying here with the casting, right? Well, yeah, exactly. In fact, when I first showed this, when I first showed this to our, our reps, uh, one of our annual meetings, Jake came over and grabbed me and said, that's great. He says, I just discovered that a few years ago with the big game. Jake has rewritten the book on big game fishing. He's taken Marlin balloon hundreds and hundreds of pounds. I mean, he, he is the man. He showed me how to catch sailfish by gra lightly grabbing the rod tip with the tip of my finger, my index finger, and my, fourth, my middle finger, and my thumb, and just standing and relaxing, just having a casual conversation while the fish is beating himself to death. And we, we can all start, I could go into this great detail, show you how it's all done with the real. And, and boy, Jake showed me some things that just really, really opened my eyes. But I said, yeah, it's the same principle. No one's ever applied it to casting, though. You can see that I got photographs and videos. You can see this rod. I mean, it looks like a darn horseshoe. It's bent right into the corks. 
and I'm not using any effort at all because I started that acceleration stroke and the, uh, you know, at, at a that wide angle, that wide critical angle. And you speed up and it just puts a bend right into the butt of the rock. It just goes, and it kind of seems like it's more like if you think of, again, the 10 to 2, right, is not always the right. This, this seems like more like a 9 to 3, right? I mean, you start way, you could start way low. No, I'm, I'm just saying depends. Again, you always start with the result. What is the cast you're going to make? In one cast, I could have that at 90 degrees. For the extreme end, I'm going to have it at 180 degrees. That's all. Because it's a principle. It's not a thing to do. It's just something that exists. And the wider the angle, if you start with that rod, you take it back and you stop at 1 o'clock, I'd say. Well, that's, like, what, 110 degrees or something like that. I don't know. Uh, okay, you go forward. It's going to bend. You'll, you can see it. The rod's loading down toward the middle of the rod. If that were back at 150 degrees when you started, guess what? That, that curve, the radius of the curve gets w- wider and flatter. You know, it's, it's, it's like you want to land a little trout or a small fish. You hold the rod straight overhead. You gotta, the tip is bent over. It's got a real tight radius, right? If, if you're fighting a bigger fish, you lower the rod and you start bringing the middle part into play. For a bigger fish, you lower it even more so you're pulling with the butt. And uh, I used to fish uh, down in, in North Carolina at Hatteras, at, uh, you know, uh, Harker's Island for years. And one year, the guides all told me they had kept track in the preceding six weeks before we got down there. They said they recorded 49 broken rods. Now catch this. These were all 10. These were 10, 11, and 12 weight rods broken on 10 to 15 pound fish. Wow. 49. Because most of these people were freshwater fishermen, trout fishermen, who came down there and are high sticking them. Oh, yeah. And the smaller that radius is, you, you, w- see, that'll work in trout fishing because, first of all, the fish is only two feet of water. He can't dive down. You know, he's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. And if, if, he, if he starts running off, well, he's opening up that curve. But if you get a real tight curve in that tip, it compresses the inside of the fibers on the rod. And that's where it's always going to break. But if you, the reason you hold it up when you're fishing for you're landing a trout is you don't want to put too much pressure on the fish. You're protecting a light tippet. And so it's no big deal. But if you use that technique, hold that rod straight up like that, and you get a, a false albacore or a striper or something close, and that fish goes down, your rod's going to break. It has to, because you're using a 20-pound tippet. And if you're in trap fishing or something, the, the tippet will break first. Here, the rod's going to break. And that's why they were breaking all these rods, because they didn't have to use it's another application of the critical angle in fighting fish. So, you know, the tighter that radius goes, the easier it is to break it. You can break that rod with two fingers. It's, they're not that durable when you misuse them. You point that lower and lower at that fish, it's impossible to break the rod. So, Ed, now, and again, now, so we're, we're working through it. So we got the critical angle. Are there, you know, as we start to think about the other pieces, are there a few other principles we want to highlight here before we start to think about wrapping this up? Or how, No, yeah. I don't know any. That's it. Any Those are the basics principles. right there. I don't, they're, they're, that, that, that's it. I guarantee you, you violated one of those things we talked about. There is, the others are not principles. They're, they're little techniques. They're little things that would help, tips. You could do this. But that's just so that you can, you know, find or, or, or you know, uh, apply these things more efficiently, but they're not mechanical principles. You could turn your hand this way or that way, but you can also do it without turning your hand. It just might make it a little easier, but it's not a, a must. It's not, there's no way you can get around. You can't load the rod for slack. I mean, I'm sorry. You know, it's, you, you put 30 feet of slack in there and you come back, nothing's happening because you can't bend the rod and so forth. Principles, do not change. They're constant. They're constant. You no, know, this is good. I love that, that we're keeping this fairly simple. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of details, but, the, you know, we talk about those things we've covered oh, yeah, so far. Yeah. So now I want to just quickly jump into a few. These are some questions that we get all the time, a lot of people have, and maybe we can just kind of, maybe it could be a little bit of a rapid fire. But, you know, for example, you know, so we've been talking about the cast. Talk about just a briefly about uh, the, the hall, right? The double hall. That, that seems like a thing that a lot of people struggle with. You know, when, first of all, right. when do you need right. to do a double hall? Is this only when you're casting 100 feet or are you using the double hall at 40 feet? You know, and talk a little bit about what, how to uh, do that correctly. Uh, we have stop motion things, we have slow motion videos. I use hall 
and called double hole. If, if I use it on back and forward, it's called double, obviously, you know, uh, I use a double hole on virtually every cast I make 10 feet, 30 feet, hundred feet. I don't care. I use a double hole. I cast, I use both hands and the, what the hole does. And I know a lot of people book, if I say this and people say, what well, speeds up the line? Well, the hole itself per se, the pull down on that line, you see that the acceleration, if you understand what I'm saying about the acceleration, you're going faster, faster. You're doing the same thing with your line hand, but going the opposite direction. They're pulling apart. So what it really does, it creates more load eat more easily. So in other words, if you just, you, you, if I get the student to hold the line, stand 20 feet away, if I pull back on the rod, you'll see the rod load, right? If I don't move the rod, but I pull down the line, you'll see the tip bend. I'm, I can load it with either hand. You see it? So it also loads the rod. Moving your hand, moving the butt of the rod, moving the grip away from the load is going to bend the rod. Pulling on the line will also bend the rod. You get faster line speed because it helps you to achieve this acceleration a lot easier. I See, what I do is I use both hands to help me load the rod. If I pick up the, with just, just use my right hand, I put my left hand in my pocket or something, I make a back cast and I go forward. Yeah, I can cast, let's just say 50 feet of line. If I now use my left hand in conjunction with my right, it's just a mirror image. The right hand's going back, the left hand's coming forward, down, right? I can get half of my load from my right hand and half from my left hand. So I don't have to make quite as long a stroke now. See, because the other half of, instead of, instead of making, and I'm just putting pick numbers out of the sky, instead of making a three foot motion, I can make a one and a half foot motion. And I get the rest of that. The other half is made up for by the pulling on the line. So I can use both. I can use both to help load it. That means I also get a deeper load. You put this together, the acceleration, the wide critical angle, and the hole simultaneous with your rod hand movement. I got news for you. You got the best of all worlds. This is what people say to me. When I first saw Lefty make that first care, I said, how the hell is it possible for him to do that with no apparent effort? Well, now people say, you make it look so easy. I said, guess what? I've watched enough videos of myself. It feels, and I said, I can see what you're saying. I said, but it feels even much easier than it looks. You've got to believe me. I said, and if you don't, okay, I, I can't, you know, but you practice enough. You're going to find that out for yourself. You can use far less effort because you're going to need more effort when you put that big fly on there. You know, you know, you watch Blaine, Blaine Chocolate throwing these dead chickens around. I mean, he's phenomenal with that stuff, but he's a great catcher. He's adapted all that. to. Th so without that thing on there, my God, it's, you know, you got to allow for that. People, people say, well, I, I've had people come to me, for example, and they'll say they think distance is an absolute thing. They say, I can cast 60 feet. I want you to show me how to cast 90 feet. I said, I can't cast 30. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, I was in the Bahamas last week. I said, the palm trees were all, you know, about 10 degrees above the horizon. I mean, they were all leaning away. I mean, that's her. He said, well, that's different. I said, it's not different. I said, it's the whole point. I said, it depends on what conditions you're under. I don't have, the, if I have a bigger fly, I have to use a much longer stroke and get a lot more load to go the same distance than if I just threw a little blue winged olive or something. So, you know, people say, how, how far do you come back if you want to throw, you know, 50 feet? There's no answer to that. What am I casting? Under what conditions? Am I going into the wind, against the wind? Do I have a 12-inch fly or a, a size 22 midge? You know, it, 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 you have to come back, I'll put a lot more load into that rod to get this big fly to go 40 feet than you did to get that little one to go 80 feet. I mean, it's all variable. That's what I mean about applying the principles. You determine how long your stroke is, how fast it is, the direction, depending on all the conditions right at that moment. Instead of thinking, oh, here's, here's what you do. Yeah, they say, oh, stand this way, do this, do that, do this. Yeah, for, 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 for one cast, yes, I agree. But make sure that you clarify that to the, to, to, to the person who's trying to learn this, that that's only for this condition and right here and now and under these circumstances. But it's going to change. Everything changes. You apply them differently. You use a long stroke or a short stroke. You use a long hole or a short stroke. Or a faster hole or a short, you know, a slower hole. I don't care. 
you go up or, up or down, everything changes, but the principles that you're using are just applied differently. They're constant. They're, you know, they, they, they just, they affect every single cast. So on that hall, when you're doing, so that hall, maybe just take it. So if, if you're going to do the, say the double hall, so when you, you, ha- let's say you have your line on the water, when you first bring up your, your rod and you start your acceleration, when do you, uh-huh. when do you make that haul just in general? When do you first make that haul, that first haul? I try to time my hole exactly with my, my line hand. Let's just call my line hand with my rod hand. If I start coming back, and, I'm, and again, this is all just relative, I start very slowly, let's say, with my rod hand moving, I'm hauling at the same time. Are you hauling slowly and then speeding, speeding, speeding with the haul as well? Absolutely. At the same curve, that same parabolic speed-up curve we have on our speedometer, it also pertains to the, the line haul. Now you can, you can, you, a lot of people, they'll make the call and they'll just haul at the end. Well, that's okay. That's going to help you. There's no question. It's going to help. But ideally now in theory, sometimes if I just need a little bit more, I'll just give a little hole, extra hole. But in theory, no, I want them to be mimicking one. another. I just want the, the hole to mimic the, the casting stroke. And I find out that that is the most efficient and it enables me to use the least amount of effort. That's the most efficient. And, the, and, and I wanted to, I noted uh, we had Joan Wolf on way back in uh, episode 100, I think. And, uh, and she talked yeah. about the double, you know, the second part of the hall that she doesn't pull down on that hall until uh, she's right at the, the very end to the, you know, kind of flicking the rest at the very end on the forward cast. Now, is, you're not saying that. You're saying on the double of the second hall, you're doing it through the whole cast, the whole forward cast. Yeah, I, I'd say I, I, ideally, ideally, if, under normal fishing conditions, uh, under, you know, yeah, I get a little lazy. I, I know I can make the cast with just one hand if I put a hole in later in the stroke just before. Yeah, it's certainly going to help me. It's going to fire that thing. It's going to tighten the loop up more because it, it again, it created more load. I mean, because when you pull on that line, you pull on that line, it's always going to give toward the resistance, you know, uh, but you know, there's, it's, it's a complicated thing and I don't profess to understand everything about it, but I'm trying to get people out of this thing of, of you know, absolute rules and anything. But the, the, the whole, basically what it does, it helps you load the rod even more easily than just using the rod hand. And that's, that's the essence. And that's and, it. Yeah. You'll find it yourself when you do it, you know, and like I say, people have to find it for themselves. I, you know, same way we all do. No, it's true. It's true. It's just like the spade cast. I, I'm actually probably more comfortable in my single hand cast than the spade cast, but, um, but you touch a little bit on the spade cast as well, right? In your book. No, no, no. I, in fact, I even say this is the, the book is, 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 is because you only do so much in one book. You yeah. can't do the whole world. <laughs> right. Uh, but no, no, I, I, I was first introduced. Now, see, I don't even like the expression spay casting. I've been teaching spay casting for 30 years with one handed rods. Spay is just a maneuver. It's a change of dir- it's a, In fact, I studied in England with Hugh Falkus, the legendary Hugh Falkus over there. And and he said to me right from the start, he says, it's a repositioned roll cast. It always finishes up in a roll cast move. And what the, all the other moves, and, and I know the guys who are really good at it, which I'm not, uh, you know, they're pushing the envelope and they're doing some really phenomenal stuff. But essentially, the way I teach it, I said, look, the line is, I'm going to go straight across stream, okay? If the line is across stream, I can come back and make a roll cast. But if, and, and let's say, and I usually say, 30 degrees to the right or left of where I'm casting, I can still do it. It's like a pie wedge. As long as the line is roughly in front of me, I can roll cast, right? So, but if the line swings downstream and it's 90 degrees now hanging down in the current and I want to cast across stream, I can't do that because I'm perpendicular to the line. I'm going, you know, east and west and the line's hanging north and south. It's hanging to the south and I want to go west. So the whole idea of the spay cast is I'm going to do a single spay or a double spay, or I'm going to do a peri poke, or I'm going to do a, a snap T, or I'm going to do a circle spay. The whole point of that maneuver is to get the line somewhere, in a rough sense, in front of me again, so that I can come back now and finish with my roll cast. And that's really what you're trying to do. You bring it, do a snap T. Well, the line jumps up here, so now it's on my upstream side again. I bring my rod back and finish with a roll cast. You know, you, you, you do a single spay, you know, you bring it around and you uh, make your, 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 your sweep and the line touches down again up on my upstream side again. 
I go right back, and then I go forward, end up forward. You end up with that same forward motion. But the whole point, and most of it is to do with repositioning the line. That's what he emphasizes. He says, you know, it's, it's repositioned roll cast. You reposition the line so that you can finish with a roll cast. That's the simplest way to do it. And I use, I use spike cast constantly on trout streams all the time. It, it, it saves me, to, and, and no back cast involved. Instead of picking the line up, make a back cast, you know, cast a little bit to the right, come back again, make it, and slice it up in pieces, like, you know, until you get it lined up straight across stream. You just do it one motion. Yeah, so, uh, that's perfect. Uh, you know, this, this idea that, you know, sp- spay casting, yeah, it, and I, but I say in the book, I said, this is, I'm doing one-handed casting here, but the same principles apply, but they're going to be a, a applied differently, maybe, for a lot of spay maneuvers, and I just can't do it all in one book. And no. I did two-handed casting for many years, just overhead casting on the beaches in New Jersey. And uh, I've got films of that and so forth. And, you know, just for, for bluefish, for striped bass and things, and using, you know, long, big, heavy rods with, you know, 500, 600 grain uh, lines. And uh, just because distance was the number one requirement. So I thought, well, why the hell am I going to kill myself with a one-handed rod trying to cap you know, 70 or 80 feet in the surf when I can pick this up and add 50 feet or more in just one motion, you know? And and the book we've mentioned this, but uh, a number of times, but it's uh, perfecting the cast is the book that's uh, you've your newest perfecting book. Perfecting the cast, yeah. You also had an older book, right? You had a, a previous book too on casting, right? Well, I had I had two. The first book was like over thirty years ago, and it was called The Cast, and it was what I knew at that time. In fact, the publisher came to me, Judith Schnell from Stackpole, who's I think just absolutely marvelous. She she talked me into doing this book, and, and I said to Lefty, I don't I don't want to do a casting book at that time. And, she, and I said to Lefty, you better redo your book. He said, No, I want you to do it. Just show them what we've nice. learned in the last twenty years. So I I got long story goes behind it, but I won't go into. But eventually I did that first book, and it was where we were at that time. And the principles I've modified things. I've discovered a lot more. Heck, this new book came out just a couple months ago, and I've learned a few little things since then you know you're never you can never stay ahead of the curve but uh no it was the same approach uh but this this one this one is it in spade this is after 45 years of coaching and it's my magnum opus it's where i am at this stage of the game uh, you know except for the few little things i'm picking up here and still learning but no it's it's everything that i can possibly have to say at this point and what i love about it is um I mean, you've got a ton of, uh, I think this is, it seems like a lot of the great book, you talk about books, right? A lot of words, but you have a lot of great photos in it. I mean, there's lots of photos of Lefty. Um, maybe just briefly, we've talked obviously about the book today, but just briefly describe, uh, you know, kind of what we've, if we've missed anything or just overall what, what the person can expect if they're going to pick up that book other than what we've covered today or have we covered most of it today? Well, well, we've, we've, we've touched upon, we've got, we've gotten just, just planted a few seeds is what we've done. Uh, and what the book goes on to do, the first, the, and, and I'll just quickly, the first chapter is called, if you just read the preface and the first chapter, you'll see the entire, what the entire book's all about. But uh, the first chapter is called Form Comes Last. In other words, we've always taught fly casting from the standpoint of form. You go to a store, you say, I want to take a fly casting. Guy takes you outside, says, here, take her in a stand like this. You see my problem already? Uh, it's got to be qualified do this, move it from here, stop it, pick it up by you and stop by your ear or something. Okay. But explain that, Hey, there's going to be lots of kayak casts. This is going to be the wrong thing to do. But for this cast that we're going to do just to get you started here. So you start sensing what this is. Here's what you do for this cast. Stop here. That'll work. And so, so that's all. So form comes, it's like the golf stroke. You create the stroke. It's the last thing you do. You don't walk up there with a preconceived notion of how you're going to do this. You got to look at all the factors, and so form comes last. Then, the second chapter is the four principles we were just talking about, and I show how you apply them different ways. And then the rest of the book, most of uh, the thing on critical angle. Then I talk about uh, all the different kind. What if you're catching really heavy flies? How would you modify these principles? It's all applications for distance. How would you modify it? You know, the same way. How would you modify? hit a golf ball driving as opposed to putting you know what changes and why and so i take heavy flies big flies dealing with wind a curve cast which is sort of a specialty with me roll cast stop and think about that for a minute so i I just cover all these things roll cast 
Dave, how do most people teach roll cast? How do they start? Just look at it. Look at the books. Listen to what they say. Well, take the rod and point it at 11 o'clock or something, right? Bada bing. You know, I say, I say maybe, but and then they say you come forward and you chop down like you got a hatchet or a meat cleaver or something, and they say, oh, you're doing a karate chop. I said, now, wait a minute. The line has to, con- this is physics, but when that rod straightens, goes back to straight, it has to conti- the line has to continue going that direction. There are no exceptions to that, right? So you're telling me you want the line to go straight ahead. Stop and think about that. I want it to go straight ahead. So you're telling me to take the rod and stroke it down toward the water. You see what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. That's what drives me nuts. Yeah. That's... And if it piles up, what do people tell you? First thing I've heard, big names say, more power. you've got to give it more power. Yeah, yeah more power. And I said, okay. In other words, you're telling me that shortage of power, a lack of enough power, made it pile up. Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to make a cast with one half the quote. I never, I've never used that word power, talking casting. I'm going to use one half the power I just used, and it's not going to pile up. So you're going to have to explain. The ball's going to be in your court. You're going to explain to me how come. If you said that lack of power made it pile up, I'm going to use half the power, and it won't pile up. No, what I'm simply going to do is get the damn rod back farther and go straight ahead. Yeah, it's the direction you stroke that See, made it pile up, just like the back you cast. Know, uh, but because somebody started off by saying start at eleven o'clock, well, for some cast, for a real short cast, that's going to work. But as you need more and more, you got to turn over one of these big flies and so forth. I recommend to people look at Simon Gosworth. He's phenomenal. He's a great friend. You look at the cover of his, of his book on single-handed spray casting. On the co- just look at the cover photo. You know, he's, he's a wealth of knowledge. He's, he's an expert in this stuff. But on a forward, he's got the rod way back. He's got a D loop. We call it a V loop. But it goes way, way back. Comes forward. Well, that cast is going to end up going. It's going to be a long stroke going forward and even rising slightly. He's going to put it into the next zip code. But you see, it's not, and it's it's single-handed space. Well, he's just making, at that point, a roll cast. But look at the big D loop goes way behind him and a nice sharp angle, and the rod's well back. He's going to make a long stroke going forward instead of a short stroke chopping downward. That's all I'm saying. It doesn't make sense. It's against the, it's against the physics. You know, I, I look at this kinesiologist and, you know, firing off cameras at 120 times a second capturing it in video and so and my my acceleration I, I that was a funny experience i was up at university of new hampshire and i'm cast and another fellow came in from dayton and these guys got computers and they're translating me on the screens uh, as a little stick man which was nice because i was putting on weight and um he showed me the first printouts and this girl they had who was a bit novice and fine he used her as a test but, and her hand was going faster than mine and, you know, that male ego is a fragile thing. <laughs> I thought, hey, does that mean she beat me? And he said, no. He said, blah, blah, blah. And he showed me the print. He said, no, you're 12 times as efficient. <laughs> and I said, fine, I'm, I'll accept that. But simply because it doesn't matter how fast you're going. It's how fast you're getting faster and how fast you stop the, the deceleration. That's the combination you have to find. And so I, I learned a lot from these people. I don't have it all. My God, no. But I, I know one thing. My, my Teaching and coaching is is much more successful. You know, the downside of this is that people don't want casting books. No matter how much, some do, certainly enough to make it worth my while, but that's not even it. I just, I, just want to, I just want to show other people what somebody else showed me. That's all I'm doing. But you see, the, the yeah, the casting books, fly tying books, they sell like ladies' cookbooks. Everybody buys cookbooks. They put them on a shelf because they're, they're they're fun. Fly tying books, flies are important. There's no question about. It. But you know, the fly tying books, you just put them away, and once in a while you try this, you find. When you look at a book on casting, it means one thing: work. <laughs> <laughs> just, you're going to have to work. You know, that's the thing, Ed. You know, some people do love to, uh, you know, don't love to read as much. That's why doing this podcast is is kind of fun because it's like for for those that, you know, maybe don't pick up your book. I mean, if you compare right now what we taught, and I know we've – we haven't covered everything, but if you compare our conversation today to reading your book, uh, did we we come close at all? 
We've come, I think we've come very, very close, Dave. And for that, I, I appreciate it. I hope it will just inspire people to just try to improve and think. I just want them to think. Number one, it's like, you know, hit them between the eyes with a two by four to get them to think. Just, just think about it a minute. Why would you do this? Why would you stroke downward when you want the line to go that direction? Oh, you know, boom, it hits you. And that's, what, that's why I learned it. That's why I, I said, Michael, why am I doing this? Once every time I learn one new little thing, I said, my God, no wonder I can't get this to go. I'm doing this dumb thing here, yeah, you know? Yeah, that's perfect. I love that. Yeah, no, I think I think we're feel, I think this is good, and obviously the book will just, you know, pick up from what we've talked about here and add some stuff. I did, before we get out of here, oh, I, yeah, you know, yeah. I mentioned the lefty. You know, obviously you, you probably knew him as, as well as anybody. Do you have, um, you know, can you leave us off with maybe a lefty story that comes to mind? I know we've heard some of these things, like the, the anthrax was named after him. We've had some of these. But is there one story that comes up? I mean, it's too too many to even, uh, you know, we spend the next 10, 12, 12 days talking about that. But, uh, I, 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 yeah, when I first met Lefty, I'll tell you just, just the day I met Lefty, I, I started a fly fishing club here in Philadelphia back in the early 70s. And uh, look, a couple of years, we got a few dollars in the kitty, and we started having guest speakers come. Well, somebody had booked at that time Lefty, like, and they called him six months in advance, could you come and speak at our club here, like, next April? And uh, so it was getting close. The day before he's due, nobody ever got back to him. Now, he said he would be there. But the day before he's supposed to come, a guy called me and says, Ed, listen, I never got back to Lefty, uh, but I, won't, I can't make the meeting. Could you call him? I said, oh, geez. I, I, I knew the name, of course. I knew he was at his book and all, first book. And I, I said, okay. So I called him. And I said, Lefty, I said, I'm calling from Mainline Fly Tires in Philadelphia. <laughs> first thing out of his mouth, well, you guys don't wait till the last minute, do you? <laughs> I said, Lefty, I'm sorry. This was just dropped in my lap five minutes ago. I said, okay. So I, I said, you're still, got, you know, you're still available. <laughs> he said, yeah. Okay. So he came up. We got together. We had dinner. We got chatting about this, that, and the other. And he uh, was doing his demonstration. And as I, as I mentioned, in the middle of a one-liner, he's telling jokes. And he makes a back kiss. And he says, hey, did you hear about the guy who says to his wife, I don't remember the rest. I never heard the end of the joke. Because when he came forward and he's just casually standing and this line just unrolling and unrolling and rolling and everybody was ooing and eyeing. And I thought they missed the whole point here. He didn't do anything that I could see you know, that I was aware of. And I said to myself, I have to know exactly what he knows or else I'm going to die. I, I, I'll never be happy. So I struck up a thing with him and I started going down to his house and I trans went from Philadelphia to Baltimore for 14 years, about every other month. Oh, wow. For one-on-one -on -one lessons with Lefty. He got me into, I said, I submitted an article one time, and I said it was, uh, it was rejected after a few months. He said, well, you got an article, bring it in. Well, I spent two years studying mayfly gills and uh, wing veins in mayflies. My first article I ever published in National Thing was how to identify mayflies through the wing vein patterns. Now, what I had dealing in that, I, so I t he said, bring it down, and I'll take a look at it. I walked in, I handed it to him. He's sitting there. He looks at it and he says, oh, you got a great title. So I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And then, of course, I don't recognize sarcasm sometimes. <laughs> he said, sounds like a biology textbook I had in high school. I said, oh, geez, he's on me already. He started going through this. He said, Ed, you've got enough material here for six articles. I said, what? This old basic stuff I thought everybody knows. He says, I don't. He says, you just spent two years working on this thing. He got me my first, I sent, he told me where to send it. He told me how to prepare my di you know, the diagrams, camera ready and everything else. I sent it off. In a few days, I got a letter which literally said a check is in the mail. And I sold my first article. Then he took me un under his wing with photography. I can't tell you all the things. I went down there. I said, I want to shoot ma a magazine cover. Let's just suppose. Because a friend got me. I was getting serious about photography. And He's, he says, this is typical lefty. Lefty doesn't do it for you. Lefty tells you how to teach yourself. And that's what I do. He picked up two magazines. He says, tell me what you see. Well, I'm looking at the composition. I'm looking at the fish. I'm looking at this. Lefty just rolls his eyes no matter what I say. <laughs> he says, what shape are these? And I said, oh, my God, they're vertical. He said, what percentage of all the photographs you have are verticals? I said, maybe 5%. He said, okay, before we talk about anything else, we throw out 95% of everything you own, huh. every picture you've ever taken. Oh, it's, that's the way he did. And he, we sat there, and for four hours, he showed me hundreds and hundreds of slides, good and bad examples, and I absorbed everything. It didn't matter if it was photography. It was casting. It was getting into writing. 
uh, the first book I did, you know, he said, no, I want you to do it. Uh, he just it led me to so many things. I've got hundreds of stories of things we did together, and uh, everything was a learning experience. I drove down one time to Baltimore, and I catch this. I just drove 100, over 100 miles, and he, he told me before I came, look, i got to go somewhere. He said, I can't give you 15 minutes. I said, that'll do. I hmm. drove down. He came out of the house. We stood in the street. He showed me one maneuver in the cast, and this is what I did for all these 14 years. He showed me one thing. He got in his car and drove away. I got back in my car. Ten minutes we worked. I went home, and I did what I always did. I spent at least two hours every day for the next few weeks oh, wow. working on each little fine point. I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm obsessed with that kind of thing. I'm a disciplinarian, and I, I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it until I, fi- until I finally found it, and I, I saw the results happening. People say, oh, I try, I, I'll teach somebody to make a cast. They say, oh, I can't get at the curve. I said, how long have you been fishing? Guys, for 30 years. I said, how many times have you tried that cast? He says, twice. Oh, that's good. You expect to get it, right? I, so, no, you, so, but that, they're the things that Lefty taught me uh, about, man, you, you've got to do it yourself. You've got to put the time in. You've got to, but you've got to think what you're trying to do. And he, he's just so generous. He just, you know, he, he didn't do it for you. He showed you how to do it and teach you. And here's what you're going to have to do. And that's what I tell people. And, uh, you know, just keep doing this and doing this and doing this. With Lefty, were you going back to your place and just casting in, in, the, in the yard, in the grass for those hours? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just, in, or in the street. I lived in, in, a, in a sort of almost a residential district of section of Philadelphia. And yeah, exactly. Or else I'd go to a, a park or a field at some place. You know, it's, hey, when I, was, when I was a tournament surf caster, I used to go out daybreak to a park in Fairmount Park in Philadelphia. They had plates in the ground every 50 feet out there, like five or 600 feet. It was a casting field, and I would throw sinkers. It was a spinning and conventional tackle, you know, revolving spool. And I recorded every cast I made for five years in a book. I mean, I, I, you know, they put a steel plate in my head to get, fix that problem. I mean, it was like I, I got obsessed with these things until I finally learned to, to, to you know, I, I become, you know, work out my problems and to learn things. You can only learn from doing, 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 and paying attention. What's happening? And, and that's that's the way I approach fly casting. If it doesn't go, anything is wrong. You know, it's either this, this, or this. I did wrong. That's all. But you got to analyze it under these conditions. Mm, you did too much of this and not enough of that. You know. Could somebody take so somebody could take your book and go through it, and could they just pick away what you talk about there, and just like you're saying, take one thing and then do it for two hours? Is is that, would that be a good way to to work through your book? Exactly, Dave. Dave you, you talked about like golf. You want to, if you want to learn how to get out of bunkers, you don't go out and play 18 holes of golf because you might have had a super day and you didn't get into one bunker that day. So what did you learn about getting out of bunkers? Nothing. You wasted your time. You might, I don't care if you shot park, scratch golf. I don't care, but you didn't learn about bunkers. If you want to do that, you go in. I've worked with PGA pros and you, you know, as far as mechanics, I don't golf. I'm the only man, some, I was told, in the Western Hemisphere who takes golf lessons but doesn't golf. I don't <laughs> golf. I don't have clubs. I just I want to understand the mechanics of golf. So you, you want to get out of bunkers? Take three buckets of balls and put them in the sand and just keep going through and going through. And you want to putt? One, one guy told me, he says, I don't leave the putting green until I sink like 100 in a row from three feet. Oh, wow. <laughs> said, a, you just keep like doing and free doing. And just, yeah. You work on parts. Yes, exa- shooting free throws. Exactly. It's like hitting hitting baseballs in the batting cage. You just keep doing that. Or bunting. You know, bunting is a whole different thing from taking a full swing. So you've got to learn each part. And eventually it'll all come together. But, you know, it's, yeah, you work on a part at a time. Work on one thing and just get that down. People say, oh, I read your book. Did you now? One of the top names in this industry said to me, I've been studying your book. He said, I've read it, reread each chapter, read it, reread, 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 reread. He says, it's incredible. He, I got a, a half hour. He was raving. But see, he understands that hey, you're not going to sit. It's not a novel. It's not a John Grisham novel. You're going to read a story. It's, it's a how-to it. thing. And you got to do one thing at a time and work on that. And that's what I did when Lefty was coaching me. I would work on one thing endlessly. And then I'd move on to the next and move on. And then... I followed him around when he was doing talks. I went to almost every show. I heard the same things over and over and over. And every time he did a demo, I'd learn, I said, wait, he said that last time, but I didn't appreciate it. 
because I had too much to learn. So I couldn't absorb it all. I'd pick up a few things and then I'd work. But then he, I'd say, hey, there's this. Oh, now I know what that means. And I, little by little, I got to a point where he did a demo one time for an organization or it was at a show or something. And I said to myself, oh, my God, I didn't hear anything new or different this time. So I said, I must be learning something because I said, this is all, I, I felt like I was on familiar turf now. I said, I know now I understand. Now it was all starting to come clear. It took a long time. It took a long time. Let's leave it, Ed. I got three quick ones to leave it out, and we don't have to go in depth to any of these. But one, okay. the DVD with Lefty, uh, does, uh, what's the name of that, and where can people find that? Is that still out there? Yes, yes, it is still. It's it's called The Complete Cast. Yeah, we spent three years. It's over four hours. They say three. It's actually, I timed it. It's over four hours, and it's doing a lot of the same things. But again, in the few years since we did that, uh, we find a few things, but Lefty and I are talking about all these different things again. Uh, it's it's called the complete cast and uh, TF. It's uh, you'll find it on a TFO website. I'll put a link out in the show notes so uh, people can just go over to TFO and grab that. Another thing, and I know this is probably a bigger topic, but I just had it as a note here. The tailing loop is a common problem, you know, that happens where you're getting tangles and stuff. Can you just quickly right. describe? Is there one thing people can think about how Absolutely. to avoid that or why people are getting Absolute, a tailing loop? Absolutely. Uh, I spend as much time working on that as anything. And again, I don't profess I understand all the physics because the physicist said to me, you don't know your, you under the so physics, you don't know the math. I can't do the math, but I can tell you this. I collected from videos, from shows, from books and so forth, up to 16 different explanations for tailing loops. One guy said you apply the power. There's that damn word again. Power too soon. Another guy said you apply the power too late. Catch this. One guy said you raised your elbow at a certain point. Another guy said, you dropped your elbow. I mean, I found these guys, 16 explanations. One of the most common things now, people just love to recite. They say, well, the rod tip travels in a concave path. That's a very popular one, right? Well, I can disprove that in about, not to, that that might not happen and end up in a tailing loop, but that's, you got to, first thing you got to ask is, okay, you say the tip went in a concave, what made it go in a concave path? What did I say already? What made the tip do whatever the tip does? Your hand. You can, and if you can, I can make a concave cast. It can be an upside down, like a U. And you, you can turn your cast upside down. The loop, instead of having what we generally consider the top of the loop as it's unrolling, you can turn it totally upside down, 180 degrees. So it's unrolling right over the water, a foot over the water, to go back underneath overhanging branches. And you do that by making your tip go in a concave path. But it ain't no tailing loop. What causes a tailing loop, and I've put a lot of time in this, and this is where I am right now, and we did the video is when we came to this, my acceleration curve, right? It's accelerating, and your hand's rotating while it's doing that, okay? You're getting faster, faster, faster. Any disruption in that cast, I don't care if your hand's going, I don't care. If that thing has an angle in it, picture a parabolic curve, a line getting ever getting sharp, bending, 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 sharper, okay? If that thing ever changes radically, if you stop or interrupt the rotation or the forward acceleration, what it does, and I've tested this and looked slow motions, you can see, I've got videos, I do super slow, I can show you everything. If my hand is coming forward and I just for a second give a tiniest little push forward, that disrupts that curve because I'm not continuing to turn my hand or continuing to speed up. If I, if I started out real fast and changed my rate, you see what I'm saying? You, or you get to the very end and you give it a little punch or something. Uh, anything that you do with your hand that disrupts that acceleration curve, either expects the acceleration or the rotation, will cause the tip to do something. And I can't describe it. I need to show you. But the, the, as a rod's coming forward, the rod is bent, Okay. And the line that's dragging behind it is programmed to go straight ahead. It's in a straight line, after all, as you're coming forward, right? So when you stop, the tip turns over, and the line just continues in that straight line. And I call that, when the rod is still bent, if you draw a line, I call it the flight path or the intended direction of the line. If that rod tip ever, and I've got the super slow motions I can show you, if that tip ever rises above that flight path or that intended direction where the line is supposed to go, you're going to get a tailing loop. 
And that happens any, any time you give a little push, you slow down, speed up, uh, your rotation stops. And what I do, it shows, I, I, I show this, I'll demonstrate, I said, this is going to be a perfect cast. Now, so 30, 40, 50 feet of line down a pond. I said, now this one is going to go down. I said, it's going to look perfect, but at the last minute, it's going to tangle. It's going to cross in itself three feet before the knot where the leader's tied. And you can, you can put it anywhere you want it. And I make the cast, it run rolls, and it tangles, and boom, big mess comes at the end. And the fun is when I say to people, now, was that a good cast or a bad cast? <laughs> and people say, well, it's a bad cast. I said, I, say, I beg to differ. That was a perfect cast. I made that line do exactly what I wanted. I told you in advance what it was going to do. See, it's a cold analytical thing, analyzing the mechanics. Yes, from a fishing standpoint, I don't want that to happen when I'm fishing. You know, so it, but that's subjective judgment. That's got nothing to do with what the rod and the line did. It was a perfect cast. I said, I'll make it tangle. You want me to make it tangle back farther? Okay, watch this. You know, it's just by varying that casting stroke. And that's what I mean by every casting problem you have is somehow related to one of those principles. You either had slack in the system. You didn't accelerate and stop properly. You, you did something there. Your tip was going the wrong direction. Or the stroke might have been too short for the cast you were trying to make. That's all. It's always one of those things. I've never seen a cast that I can't analyze in those terms. That's it. Perfect, Ed. Well, I appreciate that. And the final one, the final random one here, I always like to ask the music question. Do you have a type of music or a band throughout, you know, now or throughout your life that you listen to we can add to our uh, music playlist? Uh, Dave, you're into a world. I studied classical voice. I was baritone, bar- bass baritone. I studied German, French, Italian arias. I did opera. Oh, wow. Uh, I spent 25 years doing that. Yeah, I, I did a lot of show business stuff. I did a lot of musical comedy. Huh. Uh, I even got a chance to do a test thing in the in, in the uh, Sydney Opera House. Wow. <laughs> in Sydney, Australia. We were a, well, we were in a tour group. It was a joke. I mean, we were in a tour group, and the guy said, he was talking about the acoustics, and he said, does anybody in your group sing? Well, I, I, I wasn't singing much by that time. My wife points to me. He said, do you sing? I said, no, I used to. He said, well, just do something. I want the people to hear how they register, you know, and it goes around the room and so forth. So I did the part of the Toreador from Carmen, you know, and he said, you're a professional. I said, no, no. So, so if you ask me uh, two things, I, I, but I was not an opera buff. I just wanted that classical training. I didn't have a right to go on stage and sing, oh, what a beautiful morning, if I didn't, you know, have good control of my voice. So I spent half my life, I wanted to sing more than anything else in life. I really did. It meant more to me than anything. Uh, but I, 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 couldn't, I knew I didn't have the genes. It wasn't in my genes. I could never be really as good. I, I'm cursed with this perfectionist thing. And, uh, but anyway, yeah, music I like, and I, uh, it's got to be vocal. I'm not into instrumental a lot because I, I never played an instrument. I never had music training as a, a musician gets it with the instruments. I just did vocal stuff. And, um, I, but I have man, had a massive repertoire uh, anything that Rodgers and Hammerstein wrote, I could sing. You know, I did that in Iceland. The guy asked me to sing at a wedding reception. I said, I don't have any music. I said, tell the guy if he can play anything written by Rodgers and Hammerstein. So he goes over and talks to this guy at this reception hall, and he starts playing Edelweiss from Sound of Music. So, so we're we're good to go. You know, but no, that I, Broadway stuff, musical comedy, and classical, especially vocal uh, stuff. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like Frank Sinatra and stuff. Oh, yeah. I like I enjoy that as far as as far as popular music. I'm still of that generation. No, it's great. We have a, at uh, wetflyswing.com slash music. I have a Spotify uh, music channel going for guests. And I'll add, uh, oh, what a beautiful morning is actually from a, uh, I guess, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to find something on that and add it. it, it, it it's making for a good mix. So the opening, It's the opening song from, it's the opening song from Oklahoma. Yeah, Oklahoma. That's Same what I'm looking at. Yeah, Oklahoma in, soundtrack. So, yeah, it was the opening. It was the opening, and it was uh, in March of 1943, I think, at the St. James Theater, okay, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll, yeah. this will be fun. I'm looking. I'm looking forward to listening to that because I, I don't t- quite know it. So, all right, Ed. Hey, this has been amazing. Um, hey, it was fun. It was fun, Dave. You've really broke it down. I know. I, I know people are going to thank you for this one. So, if people want to find you, I'll put a link to your um, maybe your email. Uh, but but no emails. I will definitely get back to them instantly. I promise you that. Perfect. All right, Ed. Hey, thanks again. This is uh, this has been awesome, and you've really uh, done a great job. Uh, you know, kind of focusing things for us today. And yeah, I'll definitely look forward to keeping in touch with you. And I just want to th- say thanks for everything you're, you've been doing. Oh, that's it. my my pleasure. I'm having fun. 
So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links and everything else we cover today, including some funny, uh, funny things on, uh, we got a couple of funny videos out there. One on it's always sunny in Philadelphia, an Allen Iverson clip. And I think there might be one other bonus random one. Plus all the links and everything else we covered is at wetflyswing.com slash two, three, three, two thirty three. We've got you covered. So just check, check out that right now. I had to stop just for a minute and take a breath. Um, I know uh, that was jam-packed, so if you want, uh, it might be good to listen to this one again, bookmark it, maybe check back and remind yourself to come back on it in a month, and uh, I'm sure there's going to be some things that maybe you can follow up with, see how you're doing, but uh, I think the key here is to get out and practice at least one of those things Ed talked about today. Uh, That's probably a good idea. If you get a chance, please subscribe. If you're new to the show and haven't subscribed yet, this is the best chance for you to get updated on the next episode. I've got a couple of good ones coming out for you, so uh, click that subscribe button and you'll get reminded on the next episode. That's a wrap today. That's all I have for you. I appreciate you for hanging in and uh, enjoying this episode with Ed. It was uh, definitely a killer one for me. Probably, I think this is going to go down as, so far, one of the all-time favorites Uh, for me. This is definitely going to go down as one of the all-time favorites. So I want to thank you uh, for all of your uh, support here and hope to see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.